Hey everybody, Dutch Sense here. 2.43 a.m. Central Time on Wednesday, April 23rd, 2014. And I've got you over here on my webpage. I'm going to put a link down below to this so you guys can read up on this and investigate yourself on this new discovery that was just announced on CBS News of all places on the 21st yesterday, or day and a half ago, announcing that the use of dual beams, in this case lasers, also frequency, can be used to have an interacting effect with each other. One beam used to strip electrons from the atmosphere, the other beam used to pump up that area of plasma that's created that then forms CCN, cloud condensation nuclei particles, which form into raindrops. And they can target the beams, cross them, use one beam to pump the other one, and produce weather. And this is confirmed. Here's the article down below. The graduate students have done the experiments in the laboratory and also can control lightning. So we're not just talking about making a plasma area, making lightning and controlling where it goes using two transmitters. Now scalar interferometry, that is something that was a term that was coined by Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Bearden in the 1980s, where he talked about two transmitters crossing their beams, having a heating effect, a plasma effect at a distance which then can be used for anything from missile defense to causing weather, causing earthquakes. And he explains it all. In the 1980s, he does a full conference. This is just a small part of that. I think it's like two hours long. Anyways, you can watch Thomas Bearden explain scalar radar in the 1980s, or you can read the article confirming one beam over the other, one pulses, their word, not mine, into the other, creating the plasma bubble and controlling it. And they call it a filament. Now, here's a diagram showing real life examples of scalar interferometry happening. We're talking about two beams crossing, having an effect or an excitement where the beams cross. Here's another one. Where the beam crosses, the other beam is excited. And here's an example, real life, again, in a storm where we have two intersecting radar stations, one right in the middle, and we've got a interferometry happening in between the three. This is during the time of the Joplin tornado. We've had some very severe weather events caused by frequency. The United States Navy used frequency only, not lasers, frequency, harp and a radar to generate a plasma bubble in the atmosphere and then control it, pump it up and move it for over an hour. That was at the start of 2013, U.S. Navy using HARP up in Alaska. She can convert a radar very simply to be a scalar radar, for example. She can make it for 10 cents on the laboratory bench. She can convert a radar very simply to be a scalar radar. The subject for this evening is Soviet weather engineering over North America, which they have been doing since the beginning of 1966-1967. That was the first shot, our attempt at influencing the weather directly over the United States. They then lapsed into a lot of not influencing it for a period of years, and in 1983 particularly really opened up the big guns after having energized the infamous woodpecker signals, the so-called over the horizon radars, in the communication band in the mid-1970s. Nature has been doing this all the time in fault zones and stresses in the rocks and all the interference of the scalar potentials that are made there create fields at a distance, glowing lights. This is a picture of earthquake lights from the U.S. Geological Service. There are 1,200 locations in the United States alone where you can see glowing balls of energy, electromagnetic energy, controlled energy at a distance on any decent weather night. If you care to go out there and look and take pictures, it's easy to investigate. The so-called Earth stress lights. And with this modality, by using one additional thing, by using three-dimensional interferometry and using Fourier expansions, multiple frequencies, you can make such control balls of electromagnetic energy at a distance, just like that, like the snap of a finger. If you were weaponizing that for a big weapon, if you hit this thing explosively with your projectors and you fire two pulses so the pulses meet, 
Now, an interesting thing occurs. If you fire in the high potential mode, you get an electromagnetic explosion at a distance. If you fire in the low potential mode, you get a cold explosion at a distance, the sudden withdrawal of energy in the intersection zone. Both types of weapons widely deployed by the Soviet Union and tested. Uh, the recent, uh, some years back, so-called booms off the East Coast, some of those were seen as flashes, estimated to be about 100 uh, tons of TNT equipment were actually the orientation and alignment of such howitzers in the Soviet Union. They have had such howitzers since April 1963. Specifically, the first operational test was April the 11th, 1963, 100 miles north of Puerto Rico. The most dramatic uh, expression of the cold explosion in recent times occurred on April the 9th, 1984, and the papers fortunately won't let this one go. Off the coast of Japan, about 150 or 200 miles, well, really 200 miles from downtown Tokyo, out near the Kuros, a sudden gigantic explosive eruption occurred above the water. A cloud, so to speak, very dense, rose rapidly to 60,000 feet in the 150 mile diameter. Five 747s out there, one of which was piloted by a former B-52 pilot who thought he'd just seen the most massive nuclear explosion you ever saw. It had the mushroom shape. Uh, prepared evasive action, turned off course, put on oxygen mask, prepared and braced for a shock wave which never came. There was no flash. This was the cold explosion. A laser physicist friend of mine that I'm working with in California, in the laboratory where we're using only milliwatts at best, and we're using distances about that far, has done a little cold explosion over a dish of water and you get the mushroom cloud exactly like that, rising. That thing was called everything under the sun, bubbling gas, you know, uh, plumes, all sorts of things. It was a cold explosion. The ocean there is 21,000 feet deep, it's too deep for submarines, indicates it was a man-made phenomenon, but it didn't end there. Dr. Daniel Walker and colleagues who have access to sophisticated underwater acoustic equipment and seismic equipment did a complete study on that thing. It's published in the journal Science recently. As a matter of fact, after his study, he successfully ruled out any kind of ordinary known natural phenomenon. So we're left with the conclusion that he and his colleagues made it's either a man-made phenomenon or an as yet unknown natural phenomenon. We shouldn't have too many natural phenomenon unknown that explode for 150 miles, particularly when it's happened several times before in the open literature. That is a rigorous paper published in the journal Science very recently. Unfortunately, the journal saw fit to turn down my colleague and my explanation of what was going on and a complete date list of incidents and history and types of Soviet weapons to back it up. Here's just one more incident to show you that these types of sudden mushroom rises from the ocean or near the ocean, above the ocean, in gigantic size have occurred repeatedly with other suspicious incidents. That particular earthquake is highly suspect. Can you not see that if I dump energy with very powerful radiators and continue to dump energy on both sides of a fault zone, it doesn't matter where the extra energy comes from. With a piezoelectric effect, I'm transforming that into mechanical stress. And if I do that long enough and build up enough energy, that plate is going to slip and you'll get a natural earthquake, natural looking earthquake, man-made. That's how you make earthquakes. Well, in the mid-70s, we got a shock. Suddenly, the communication systems throughout the world in the communications band, that is from 5 to 30 megahertz, were widely being interrupted by extremely powerful signals coming from the Soviet Union. To my knowledge, we have not yet located the transmitters. They had many resemblances to what we call an over-the-horizon radar, so we promptly labeled labeled them an over-the-horizon radar. The so-called woodpecker signal is named from the chirp signal that sounds like a woodpecker's beak hitting a flat block. You can hear them out there most every night chattering away, still interfering. In fact, they now sell the ham radio operator's filters so that it operates through that, filters out in that region. But what they actually did shortly before the death of Brezhnev, they started adjusting across the United States a great interference pattern from multiple transmitters of the woodpecker radars. Now, I'm not interested 
except the biological effects, which can be damaging, in the conventional E field, B field signals on that radar. But we don't have anybody who's measuring the scalar component, the substructure in the zero. They don't even have the instruments to do it. If they wish such instruments provided, I have a friend who will do it for price. Not me, he will. He built the instruments and designed them. They won't even detect it. Anyway, where the interference was, if you'll check the woodpecker signals, you'll see that's a type of interference pattern. They set up an interference pattern over the U.S. and it left signals, signatures. When you adjust these things and you adjust with little slips, you pop out energy, you get rumbles and booms and earthquakes and all this, and those things happened from Florida, North Alabama, Virginia, all up through the Carolinas, up through Mid-England, up through the middle of the country, Texas, all over, West Coast, everywhere. These mysterious cracks and rumbles and booms and pops and snaps everywhere while they were adjusting the grid. Well, they got it adjusted by shortly after the end of the year, that is in early 1983, they got this thing adjusted and they started pouring it on us. So that spring, early spring, you had extremely severe flooding because what they did, you simply determined by your timing and interferometry and Fourier transforms which one of the grid cells you want to activate. And they're much finer than this. By the way, over Huntsville, Alabama, a friend and I saw this grid from horizon to horizon in even plowed field rows north to south and from horizon to horizon in even cloud rows from east to west. And that is not natural, it does not happen. Anyway, what they did is you, if you take energy out of one cell, that produces a low zone, a low pressure zone. If you add energy in another cell, that produces a high pressure zone. I think you can see, if I scan my radar, or rotate it, the beam, either electromagnetically or rotate the antenna, gently and move those highs and lows alone, I can direct and capture and control the jet streams. And that's exactly what they did. The jet streams had a classic bend dipping way down south abnormally far and then roaring up the Adirondack chain. And so we had all kinds of good weather following that pattern and the deviation of the jet streams. Even the Journal of Science has published an article from a study that shows in the last decade the variation in the weather over North America has been greater than can be statistically expected except once in 1,200 years. That summer we got a drought. If you recall, we lost half the corn crop in the United States in one summer from the extreme drought. When you form one of the patterns, you get a signature in the clouds. You see a, a little droplet of water is formed around a dust particle, a little droplet of ice that's cold enough, and it makes a little transistor or a little diode in the middle, and that thing forms its own little E field, and these things line up. And what you get is you get a ring, almost a complete ring, about two-thirds of a ring of clouds, like geometrically drawn, around the peak where the energy is, is being manipulated, and you get radio lines, thin radio lines running directly away for 10 or 15 miles. Sort of like the old rising sun symbol in World War II. We saw these all over the United States. Here's one taking a block and a half from my home. By the time I could run in and get my camera, it had passed just over the mountain. But you can see those are cloud streamers. Those are not light rays. These are not crepuscular waves at all. These are cloud rays. These are radios, giant radios. I then went ahead and chased that thing over the mountain to get a little better shot of it. They had cut the energy so the middle ring filled up, but the rays were still apparent in the next slide, although I'm now shooting at an extreme distance uh, through a telescopic lens. But you can see if the lights were a little dimmer, you could see the crosshatch interference pattern in the streamers also. So we have both the streamers and we have the crosshatch interference pattern existing in the clouds. That's over Huntsville, Alabama. Here's one that a correspondent sent in, and again we have dim light. The clouds are actually more prominent than that from California. They were seeing them all over the United States, these very prominent, very significant patterns everywhere. I went on radio, uh, KABC in Los Angeles, calling everybody's attention to this two or three times, delivered papers at a couple of symposia, and we saw a change. We saw the doggone thing start getting active most of the time at night. There's another pattern. Sometimes they use two patterns close together. When that happens, the internal rings go out, and the rays become much thicker, and they become absolutely boat tailed toward the center. Now, when they cut the power, the center fills up immediately with clouds. I have been unfortunate, and although I have seen classic ones of this, I have not yet got a decent picture. I will show you what I have, which is not a good photograph.
and the photographs then therefore should not be accepted as proof until I get better photographs, which I will do sooner or later. Again, multiple witnesses over Huntsville, Alabama, a good friend of mine, and I saw this very early in the morning, this system motoring along, absolutely classic. I was very hard pressed that day on my normal job and did not take off from work and go home and get my camera. I have regretted it ever since, deeply. I didn't realize how rare the phenomenon was going to be, to be able to get one that perfect. But it was absolutely flawless and it looked just like that, right over Huntsville, Alabama, moving along at over 20 to 30 miles an hour. A second one came over later that day. That is the dates and the time. Uh, in their weather control, if you recall, they gave us anomalous winter, a very cold December snap of 1983, which broke all the records everywhere. Many of them since records have been kept on the cold. And that was deliberately engineered. They left signatures before they did it with these kinds of things all over the U.S. We saw the same day uh, remnants of a second twin giant radio system that motored along across Huntsville, Alabama. Now, here is one. They've cut the power, but the system persists for a while. It'll persist for several hours, but it'll fill in. It will lose its classic shape. But, you know, even the filled-in picture is better than no picture, but I don't have a lens which will take the entire sky. I need a fish eye, which I'm going to get as soon as I can afford it. But what I want to show you is this is only, I believe, the northeast here, and I want to focus your attention here over to the right. You will see the lines of the clouds going there. They go all over the sky, back to the other radio on the other side. Completely over your head is this giant radio connected up to two points, even though it's still in here now because the power has been cut. In this photograph, we're just a little bit back around from where we were to the left to show that the same cloud streaks and radios are going over on the left, and they go completely across for about 15 miles to the next point, the next radio intersection where they link up. Now we'll show that other linkage down on the other end as a separate shot. And that's really, as you can see, it does go on down there and link up. It's just beyond the true line where it links. It's faded on that end pretty good. But we had a whole two radio system, a poor picture here, I admit, 